Welcome to the Morton Brown Family Wealth Intentional Wealth Update. I'm Katie Brown and I have Cody Dummel here with me today. Hey Katie, how are you? Hi Cody, good, good. So in these conversations, we try to talk about a spectrum of financial concepts. And the last couple, we've been pretty focused on investing. Really, and we've sprinkled it in over the past year or so, there has been a lot of investing conversations as we've had a little bit of a wild ride. But right now we're, we're finding ourselves in this spot where we're no longer at the bottom, which is fantastic. We've had a little bit of a recovery from some of the turmoil from last year, but we're not back up to the highs yet either. So we're in this, this sort of middle ground. So we thought we'd take a pause from the investing conversation and talk about all the other high value decisions that you can make in your financial life. Now I say all, we're not going to be able to touch on them all, but spend a little bit of time talking about some of the other types of decisions that we make in our financial life and how they really do impact our success going forward. So Cody, why don't, why don't you kick us off? We're actually going over an article back from 2020 that Dennis wrote, just touching on some of the high value decisions and sometimes how you can feel paralyzed when some of those decisions come up, especially as you're, you're nearing retirement. Obviously we're not at the lows anymore in the stock market or the bond market. We're not back quite to the highs yet, but we've had a, a good bounce from the fall of, of last year, both on stocks and bonds. So just rehashing some of the high value decisions that you, know, you should be looking at, you should be working with your financial advisor as you're getting close to retirement. And then obviously just continued into retirement, just making sure you're using the assets the way you should be making sure you're doing the tax efficient investing. And when you take out the assets, make sure obviously you're doing that as tax efficient as, as possible too. Yeah. You know, I think oftentimes we get so caught up in market returns and how are things returning? And, and it's a good reminder that we can't control what the market does, but there are things that we can control in our financial world. And so, as you mentioned, tax efficiency, having the right structure around the types of income that you may be receiving in the portfolio. Also, the, the types of income that you might be receiving outside of the portfolio. So decisions around your pension elections or Social Security, those are huge those have huge impacts to your financial life going forward. We often talk about what are the different income streams and then how does the portfolio backfill some of those income streams? So how do, how do you see this showing up sometimes with, with families, like social security decisions, for instance? Yep. Social security is always a, a huge topic going into retirement. So normally we like to, if possible, to delay social security as long as possible. If every year you delay, you get 8% bump up the next year if, if you delay social security. So ideally we would like to wait till age 70 if you have other assets that you can use in the first couple of years of retirement, if you retire before age 70. And that was definitely something that we were trying to do as long as possible back when interest rates were, were so low. Now that interest rates are a little higher, you can maybe make the argument that it's not as beneficial to delay because you can get four or 5% on some yield on fixed income now. Um, but those are obviously always conversations that we have with, with our clients as you're getting closer to retirement or in retirement, when to take social security and the differences of if you delay till 70 or if you take it at full retirement age. Yes. And I, I think one of the things too, that is, is often overlooked when it comes to social security is it's not only that increase from your full retirement age, which for most people is right about 67 up until age 70, where you get that 8% increase. But also now you've raised the floor um, or that baseline for the for that those Social Security benefits. And Social Security does have the cost of a living adjustments each year. And so now you've started at a higher base. So your compounding accelerates that much further. There were studies done, I, I think about two years ago, where they said that 96%, it's a really high number, but let's just say a very high percentage of Americans don't make the right decisions around Social Security. And I think I would, if I could switch, I had a magic wand, I would love to start from the assumption that people will take social security age 70 and then by exception, they take it sooner. Yeah. I think oftentimes people go into the mindset of I qualify age 62. So now convince me why I should take it later. Yeah. If we could flip that around, I think that would be beneficial for so many families. 
so, so Cody, that's a little bit about social security and, you know, that's something that we can definitely go deeper on and we'd love to figure out the right mix for specific families, but let's talk about some other things and maybe the decision-making process. Obviously there's a whole bunch of different decisions you need to make as you get closer to retirement and think back to the article that, that Dennis wrote, this was back in 2020. So three years ago, obviously we had the huge sell-off when the pandemic hit and then we had to bounce back. And one of the articles that Dennis referenced in the, in the blog is a study from Fidelity that only 10% of 401k participants moved their investments when we had the huge sell-off. So during that huge sell-off, it was actually good that people weren't making fast decisions to get out of the stock market, get back in. They held their investments through it. So sometimes, you know, not doing anything with some of the high value decisions can be good. But then you also think about times now where people are like, well, I think the stock market's going to sell off, so I don't want to put money to work. And that's where we have to come in as advisors and obviously talk through the differences and, and talk through making sure you have the right asset allocation between stocks and bonds. To, even though now we've obviously we bounced back a, a good amount from the lows, you can still make the argument that it's a good time to put investments into stocks and especially bonds right now. Yeah, yeah. But I think going to your, your point too, to to not necessarily rush into those decisions and to lean on your advisor to understand both sides of how that might show up or how decisions may show up. I think when it comes to the investment portfolio, yes, but then also outside of the investment portfolio. So, so for instance, other high value decisions might be around legacy and maybe charitable intent and, and making sure that the right assets are flowing to the right individual or the right charity to, to really maximize the, the benefits for the recipient, but also maximize the, the tax benefit. And so I, I think it's that, that patience to work through the process and fully understand, I think is really important too, because at the end of the day, when you have large chunks of money flowing in one direction or another, and you're coordinating other income streams coming in, all of those things may be outside of the specific stocks or bonds that you own. Those are kind of the, the bigger overarching decisions and impactful things that, that you may make in your financial life. Yep. So how about pulling in the communication component of these large decisions? How, how should we be thinking through that element of it or, or how do we see that show up? You know, we as advisors and as a team here try to get the whole family involved because God forbid if, if something did happen, making sure that everybody's read in and that we're able to explain it as much as possible. Because if something happens, you don't want everything to just land on the other spouse or the other inheritance beneficiaries and, and nobody really know where the assets should go, how should the flows continue going forward. So we always try to get everybody involved as much as possible in those financial decisions. Yeah, I, th I think that's so important. Pulling forward an, another oldie but goodie blog here, succession of the indispensable one. And it's not even always intentional. Um, sometimes it's just the natural division of labor where one person in the couple may be running the majority of the family's finances and it just becomes habit and it just becomes easy for them to manage it. Whereas at the same time that becomes habit there, it becomes a habit not to look at it maybe by the other participant in the couple. And so recognizing you may unintentionally create yourself as the indispensable one that has the plan, has the understanding of it, but we need to recognize that in order for that plan to be sustainable and valuable for the entire family, there has to be the ability to hand it off. So that's, that's another really good productive use of time in figuring out how do we get enough on the same page and bring enough clarity and simplicity to the plan that it can be handed off when it needs to be handed off or just executed as it needs to be executed? Yeah, I think that's another high value decision that we help our clients with as financial advisors is setting up the estate plan and make sure that we speak through and help how we can with the estate attorneys to make sure once somebody does pass away that the assets are going to flow to where they want to. Yes. Yeah, we definitely want to be mindful of once again how things flow and, and make sure that it it fits into that master plan and that everybody's on the same page with it. And I love that you brought up the other advisors because that's so important as well. Because if there's an estate plan that's in place and it's not 
fully communicated. There are, there are elements that land on the legal side and there are elements that land on our side when it comes to beneficiary designations and helping to kind of map out what that looks like in, in the large plan. And so that collaboration with your financial advisory team and your legal and accounting team and everything else is just so instrumental to making sure that it's successful for the family. Thank you for joining us. And if you do have any questions for us specifically or any questions about Morton Brown, please feel free to reach out to us at mortonbrownfw.com. Bye.